Broadcasting from the Unshackled Studios in Melbourne, this is Wilms Front, brought to you by theunshackled.net. Now here's Tim Wilms. You were writing about uh, the IMARC conference uh, months in advance that uh, the various socialists, Marxists and anarchist groups in Melbourne, they, well, one of the organisers said, says so themselves that they wanted to be like the S11 riots in Melbourne in, in 2000 when there was a globalisation uh, conference. Well, they, they, they did yeah, cause... Yeah, we talked about that previously. They did cause... Uh, when uh, left-wingers were against globalisation. Hmm. Well, they they did cause uh, s s some mayhem uh, this week, but in my opinion, it was no S11. I'm not sure. How, how did you see it? Well, it was really interesting because I was inside their um, their chat groups, and um, I'd managed to get inside some of their signal groups as well. And so you saw as the day approached, they started getting more and more worried because when they first announced this back in August, they thought that with the uh, Extinction Rebellion sort of protests going on and the general momentum from that, that they'd be getting somewhere between one and 5,000 people. And in the end, they didn't end up getting anywhere near that. They, at most, I think on one day, they got about 400 at the most, if that. And so uh, it was, uh, in terms of numbers, it was a severe disappointment for them. The, the Monday when the, the conference uh, began, it was it was pretty mediocre turnout, but the, the organisers said, oh, yeah, tomorrow's yeah, our, 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 our big day. And, of course, the, the, they claimed that the, the police just unprovoked attacked them uh, with uh, batons. But, of course, you have the right in Australia and Victoria to uh, lawfully protest, but... You cannot block uh, people's access to the roads, or at least that's what uh, the law says, or uh, block them from entering a, a private uh, building or or the, the exhibition and convention centre. At you, you hire it out for private events, and obviously this mining conference they had paid the the exhibition and convention centre a fee to, to hold it there. They It was a, a legal private event and if you had a ticket there then obviously you on the on the public air, uh, uh, publicly shared footpaths and roads you had a legal right to go into that uh, private event and of course when the uh, the protesters started blocking that uh, it seemed to me that the, the uh, Victoria Police they, they definitely they were mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore because there was just at uh, because they 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 screamed and bitched and moaned as they they always do that uh, police brutality these these marxists and socialists but victoria police all throughout the week said uh, it, the response was appropriate we're happy with how our officers uh dealt with it even when it was uh, one of the, uh, the the channel seven uh uh, re uh, reporters, uh, he he got uh, moved on. Apparently, that was a big outrage because apparently he's supposed to have a journalism license. Victoria Police said no, he didn't follow. Uh, uh, Jack Dowsley, I think, was his name. Uh, he, yeah, uh, I don't remember his name. Yes, uh, and of course uh, there was they the. They laid hands, Tim. Tim, they laid hands on a journalist. How dare they? Don't they understand that they don't even, most of them don't even have a university degree. They laid hands on one of the chosen people. My God, how dare they? Uh, the and reaction that... from journalists on Twitter, the reaction from journalists across online is just like, uh, oh my, I've, you rarely see them so angry as when somebody lays a finger on one of their chosen little club. Oh yeah, the, the Fargo... Uh reporter there that's the melbourne university student rag apparently even though she's a student sh and apparently she's still got a journalism license she got uh, pepper sprayed that was an outrage as well yeah i saw the pictures of her being pepper sprayed i smiled at those <laughs> but the truth of the matter is is like what you went over there's a couple of different takes on this the first is of course you are not allowed to block people from going into a place that's illegal and uh, you're not allowed to do that against the law. This is something that needs to be said a couple of times because apparently for most of the journalists in Australia and of course for the socialists, they apparently don't think that's the case. Uh, but no, you're not allowed to block somebody else's building. 
you are allowed to protest in any place you want, peacefully. Uh, you're allowed to even get very loud and noisy and boisterous of your protest. You're allowed to jump up and down and make up amusing chants. You're not allowed to block the entrances to a building, particularly when the main entrance they blocked was the disabled one with the wheelchair ramp. Uh, it, uh, so Victoria Police were entirely within their rights to come in and try and move them out, and of course they failed to comply, which is failure to comply with police instructions. That's also <laughs> an arrestable offence. Uh, it is a shame that most of the ones who were arrested, because there were quite a few very well-known far-left extremist names that were briefly arrested, like Jerome Small and Edward Plowman and people like that. But the police just did catch and release, unfortunately. They arrested them, had a chat to them, moved them away from the barricade and let them go so they could come back to the barricade again. You've but been naming and shaming these uh, socialists and Marxists for, for years now, but I, I noticed you had a, a, to put it crudely, a, a, a bit of a, uh, what do you call, uh, what do you call that, uh, 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 doxing orgasm when Andrew Bolt and, and Sky News, they started naming and shaming uh, the organisers and, and prominent uh, activists who were there. Well, it's, it's such an obvious thing. It's, it is the biggest scandal in Australian journalism. Uh, it is the biggest scandal that has been in, well, in modern Australian journalist history, journalistic history. Uh, it is the fact that nearly every major march, nearly every major protest that's on the left in Melbourne, there are exceptions, but nearly every major one, is organised by far-left extremists, revolutionary Marxists who want to overthrow the government and implement a totalitarian state. And Andrew Bolt actually came out and said that. Hmm. He's the first, <laughs> oh, look, he's mentioned Marxists before, but that's the first time he's actually come out and said, hey, wait a second, these people, they want to overthrow the government hmm. and bring back communism. I mean, and they're not even shy about it. I mean, people laugh, oh, oh, oh communism. No, no, really. Uh, these are old-fashioned Marxists. They want to overthrow the government and implement a totalitarian socialist state. Uh, they, it's on them. That's what they genuinely believe. And they're, well, con considering the small numbers that they actually got to this blockade, uh, just looking at the photos and looking across my records, I reckon probably about um, a quarter to a third of the people who actually showed up were known active members of uh, far-left extremist organisations. And that doesn't even count the ones that I don't know. Well, one of the uh, ones this... you've uh, written about regularly was uh, Jerome Small, who uh, was one of the ones who, as you said, were were caught and released. Uh, this is an image of him uh, giving an interview to, to 3CR, which seems to be... Well, 3CR seems to stand for uh, Communist uh, Radio because they, they host so many far-left uh, programs, and of course no, that's why... No, 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 Tim, Tim, that's... That's just not true. They also host anarchists. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, of course, they receive public funding through the public, uh, through the community radio organisations and that sort of stuff. Yes, uh, uh, of, of course uh, they... Although, I, I have to, it has to be said that every, nearly everyone who broadcasts on them is a volunteer. They don't uh, get paid, but their upkeep costs and the like and their licence are all based off public funding. Hmm. Uh, so, so Jerome Small, uh, please, uh, for our audience, uh, name and shame uh, his associations. Oh. Well, Jerome Small started back in the 1980s. That's how far he's back he's been involved in um, far-left extremist politics. He was in the ACT back then. He was involved with various far-left groups. By the early 90s, he was a member of the International Socialist Organization, which is a Trotskyist group which means that they want to have a communist revolution, but they don't want they want to, to stop the early Soviet Union and not go to the Stalinist version. So just the part where they were murdering people rather than murdering people with a fun moustache. Uh, then in um, uh, 1995, Mick Armstrong, Jeff Sparrow and a few others were thrown out of the International Socialist Organisation and um, Jerome Small uh, left in protest with them. Uh, people will know that uh, name, uh, Jeff Sparrow. He's a Guardian columnist, or some people might call him a Guardian, yeah, Guardian journalist. Columnist. Mm. And with Jeff Sparrow, Jerome Small founded the Socialist Alternative, another revolutionary Trotskyist group which wants to overthrow the government. 
Uh, Jeff Sparrow has never apologised for creating the largest, what is now the largest violent extremist organisation in Australia. He's never announced his views, and even a couple of years ago he was speaking at socialist alternative conferences, and he was trying to promote the IMARC blockade himself in the run on Twitter and on Facebook in the run-up to the event. So, yeah, that tells you everything you need to know about the Guardian Australia's uh, political leanings and their uh, attitude towards extremist associations. But uh, Jerome Small, yeah, in um, the late 90s, he was involved in organising the attacks on Pauline Hanson meetings in Melbourne. Very violent, sometimes, attacks that happened in Melbourne in the late 90s. In uh, 2000, he was involved in the original S11, although this has only really been a pale sort of, uh, like, a uh, very pale uh, repeat. Uh, he was involved in that original one, which was the anti-globalisation protests around Crown Casino, which ended in mass violence, the Premier of Western Australia being trapped in his car by rioters and having to be rescued by police. Uh, mass violence, vandalism across the course of many days, which is what they were trying to recreate here with the IMAP protests. Um, the next year, he was arrested uh, for the follow-ups to those protests, because this is how those things work. They mobilise a large amount of people for an event, like they have this time with the Extinction Rebellion stuff, and then they try and roll those people into future events. And that's what happens. In, what happened in uh, the S11 protests was that, and uh, they had the what they called the M1 protests May Day the next year in 2001. All these things have really been sort of forgotten in the aftermath of uh, the September 11 attacks, but uh, they all did happen, and they were all very important at the time. So he was arrested. Out, he was arrested and fined outside the uh, protest outside the Nike store in Melbourne. Uh, a little bit after that, he started uh, getting involved in the refugee movement, and his house was raided in regards to creating false passports for uh, refugees. Um, he's been involved in all sorts of different protests since. He was one of the organisers of the anti-Reclaim Australia rallies. He was involved in the socialist alternative contingent for the East-West protests. He's been pretty much involved in almost everything. I mean, uh, as a, I believe he's a CFMEU member, and um, he was involved in trying to spruik gay marriage to, see, to the CFMEU as well. And, um, yeah, so his, his technical um, sort of uh, title is industrial organiser, because he's the one who's supposed to be coordinating those members of Socialist Alternative that are infiltrating the union movement. And there's been a, a couple of programs of that, although he hasn't had a huge amount of success. Uh, let's so, go yeah, to the... The idea, the, that yeah. who, the, idea that, the idea that someone who has been a member of extremist groups since the late 80s has been actively trying to overthrow the Australian government since the late 80s, then comes out and organises another protest, and only Andrew Bolt actually names him for who he is. Uh, only Andrew Bolt and me. <laughs> name him for who he is and the fact that this guy genuinely and a large percentage of the protesters there were protesting against that mining conference because they want to overthrow the government they want to create enough momentum with this campaign to cause enough civil disturbance to bring enough people into their folds so that they can convert them to hardline Marxist ideology so with an aim to eventually overthrowing the government in the in the future and and yeah, no journalist bothers to look this up. And this is all publicly available information, not just publicly available because I've published it. It's publicly available everywhere. Uh, uh, the, the idea the, that you yeah. they couldn't find this out is insane. The main organiser of this, uh, well, she, she's from the, the next generation of Marxist revolutionary activists, is uh, uh, that's Emma Black. Emma Black you're talking about? Yes, and here she is. I'm, I'm showing photos yeah. of uh, all Black of them here. Emma one of the main ones. Oh, she wasn't? Uh, this is the thing. I've got, I've got access. She was the main spokeswoman. I've got access to their minutes and some of their internal signal stuff. Uh, most of the promotion and um, sort of propaganda stuff that was done was done by Jerome Small and Omar Hassan, who's another socialist alternative guy. He's the editor of Marxist Left Review, which is their theoretical magazine. Mm. Uh, and the money for all of the posters that got put up all around Melbourne I think it was $1,500 or so, came directly from Jerome Small's pocket. Um, he funded 
this, um, the organising for this process. He coordinated with the unions because there was, I think, there was a health services union meeting on Monday at the exhibition centre as well that they had to work around. Right? He did the coordination. He did all of that stuff. So it was all him in the background. But Emma Black, because she's photogenic, much more so than. Uh, Are you saying that they're objectifying her? No, I'm saying that they're smart enough to realise that if they put a pretty girl at the front, then they're more likely to get uh, good coverage, which they did, uh, particularly on Sunrise and a lot of the yes, morning Yes, that's shows. the image that I just uh, showed. Emma Black, Emma, Black, yeah, Emma she, Black played fantastically to the press yeah. because she's like, you know, waif-like blonde chick, right, fairly young. Uh, so, right. <laughs> but she is, of course, a hardcore nurse. She's a member of the uh, Melbourne Continental Philosophy Society, which is a bit of a nice way of saying um, sort of Marxist and associated philosophers. Yeah, and uh, she was she, on Sunrise uh, the, with her Victorian a, socialist shirt on as well. Yeah, she's on, on Sunrise with the Victorian socialist shirt. Victorian socialist was founded in 2018 by Socialist Alliance, Socialist Alternative and Stephen Jolly. Uh, Jerome Small stood for them in the federal election in Caldwell. He got, uh, I think it was four point something percent, which is actually pretty good for an openly Marxist mm. group in Australia. It was uh, not too bad, actually. Andrew Bolt made fun of him saying that he didn't even get five percent, but openly Marxist groups don't have electoral appeal in Australia. They don't have the grassroots support that their media profile would suggest. I mean, that's kind of why they need to have so many boots on the ground. And as I mentioned, uh, Sky News, when I said they doxed the organisers, they published, uh, or Andrew Bolt did, he published the, 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 the press release with the organisers' names and their phone numbers as well. And that's on, contrary to, to what people disparagingly say, I mean, Sky News is a national news network, and so I wonder if they got uh, some interesting uh, phone calls uh, during the week. Uh, but uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of the, I'm not sure if it was an organiser, but uh, Jacob and Andre Wertha. Yeah, he was one of the Socialist, yeah, he was one of the Socialist Alliance. Yeah, Socialist, Socialist Alliance. Alliance. Here, here's the yeah, screenshot Alliance from the interview. One, yeah, Socialist Alliance was once the largest Marxist group in Australia. They have, because of like repeated electoral defeats, they've never scored more than 1% in any election um, at a state or federal level yeah. uh, in any state or in any electorate. Uh, so yeah. Because they put all their eggs in the electoral basket and because they just continually kept getting beaten up, most of their people fritted away. But uh, they've managed to hold on with a few people and they threw their eggs into the socialist alternative basket for this. And, and in reward, I guess, the um, they gave they gave poor Jacob an interview, uh, permission to do an interview with uh, Andrew Bolt. If you look in the interview that uh, Emma Black did with Sunrise, you can see Jacob sort of hanging around in the background, hoping for his turn, which <laughs> didn't happen. Well, he he did get his. <laughs> Socialist, his... Alliance, Socialist Alliance is very very definitely the junior partner now. Yeah. Uh, uh, Socialist uh, alternative uh, this evening. He grabbed hold of that interview with, with Andrew Bolt, uh, which, of course, when it, uh, Marxist socialists, they go up against anybody who doesn't agree with them, then it always ends with a uh, disaster. And, uh, of course, uh, Jacob said, oh, this was uh, democracy. And he ba basically was uh, promoting a form of mob democracy who can mobilize the most people on the street and andrew bolt said well what if i wanted to come to your house to say how much i disagree with you and it's like oh it's a mobilization game so basically he is is saying here in, in the the interview i suggest everyone uh, go go and watch it uh, that we have s some kind of street warfare to solve political disagreements and apparently melbourne should be run by warlords who control the various territories well it's the logic of bolshevism it's the logic of the early bolshevik revolution uh, and most of the people in russia didn't want to have a communist revolution but the Bolsheviks did, and they had enough people on the streets of St. Petersburg. Mm. Or Petrograd. Oh. Somebody Saint said Petersburg. here, uh, Jacob sounded very feminine. It's the sort of logic they use. And that's the same logic that they use today. These people don't have a huge amount of uh, imagination. Uh, most of them are still running, if you go to their meetings, they're still running off the same texts 
that Lenin was writing in the early 1900s before the revolution even happened. Uh, they're still studying over those, though they're sacred scripture, the same way the Muslim would study the Quran. Uh, they, and this is the sort of the thing, like, these people are fanatics. Uh, they really are. They have a creed, they have an ideology, and they're not even shy about saying it, but journalists just do not even mention it. They don't even mention who these people are, what they believe, and the organizations that they belong to. What I learned from Andrew Bolt's interview with uh, young Jacob is that obviously he, uh, his, like I said, his view of democracy is uh, street warfare. He would have no uh, f respect for the quiet Australians or the silent majority, which is this: how democracy works is that you vote in elections, you stand as a candidate. We had a federal election in May. We had a state election back in November 2018. The various socialist parties hardly got much of the, the overall uh, vote. Uh, we do have a system of, of property rights. Well, obviously, they, uh, <laughs> they, they don't respect private property rights. And so you, you, it's a... You, you're asking a question to a brick wall. They they don't believe that your 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 home is your castle, and obviously they, the way we govern public property such as roads and and footpaths is that the governments that we elect uh, enact laws and regulations about how they are operating. But this is where they twist what they term civil disobedience, and this is what a lot of the Extinction Rebellion people said because. Uh, how your the the traditional way of protesting, putting your message out is well. In the old days, it used to be uh, handing out flyers and uh, magazines. That's that's of course what the the Socialist Alliance have done with their their Green Left uh, Weekly, and the, the Socialist Alternative one is is Red Red Flag. And I think it was, I I, I think. I can't remember if it was Piers Morgan or Nigel Farage when they were interviewing the Extinction Rebellion in the UK, basically saying, nobody's listening to us, and because this is an emergency and we've got all these climate uh, criminals around, we're forced to take this action. And so they, they don't define it as law-breaking, it's civil uh, disobedience. But of course, uh, that's obviously... That's noble, like you believe that it's noble, but say, but what if, if say, a bunch of uh, Australian nationalists uh, superglued themselves uh, to the Melbourne roads to protest further immigration, saying we're going to keep doing this until the immigration rate is cut to, say, 10,000 a year nationwide? I don't think that would be considered in the eyes of the, the media and other uh, so-called uh, free speech activists. I, I, I just saw a tweet from Sarah Hansen young She's worried about freedom in Australia. Imagine if, if nationalists decided to, to do that, superglue themselves to protest mass immigration. Well, of course. Right? It only goes one way, and that's the way they like it. Mm. Uh, um, I mean, and it is the journalists that allow them to get away with this. As you said, in our democratic system, people get to vote on whether or not they like Marxism. They get to vote every few years. And they routinely and emphatically vote no. Right? Even people who consider themselves on the far left usually vote for the Greens. Right? And the they Greens were there this week. Uh, Adam Bant uh, wouldn't say anything bad about the, uh, the IMARC protesters, although he did when he was uh, addressing them uh, stress this is a peaceful protest. Yeah, well... The, uh, this is the thing. The Greens are able to get away with this. Uh, the Greens are able to involve themselves in what... This This wasn't like a, a large protest, like the gay marriage protest that the Socialist Alternative or Socialist Alliance had managed to latch on to and had organised a small part of it. This was entirely organised by the Marxist groups with a little bit of anarchist groups sort of tacked on as they normally do. All right. The, uh, the fact that the Greens were able to show up, that the deputy co-leader of the Greens, Adam Bant, the, the former Senator Lee... Is Rhiannon, he still uh, deputy co-leader? I can't keep up with who their various co-leaders are. That's what Wikipedia says, so we'll go with that for now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, and uh, Samantha Ratnam, the head of the Victorian Greens, uh, and Lydia Thorpe, their former lower house member in Victoria, uh, all show up and speak at an event organised by a revolutionary communist group. Uh, and the media doesn't tell anybody. Mm. Uh, they're able to get away with this 
so repeat, repeatedly, over and over again, and so flagrantly and so openly, because the media simply doesn't even mention it. Right? Well, uh, we because will give uh, uh, some so, so, some other credit here. Uh, uh, Neil Mitchell and Tom Elliott on on Three AW, they've been going pretty hard as well. They are going hard, but then not mentioning who these people actually are. I've seen, um, for instance, Neil Mitchell has interviewed uh, Natalie Ackerman who was behind a lot of the Extinction Rebellion protests and is again a socialist alternative organiser. And he didn't mention that she was from Socialist Alternative. Right, back during the uh, protests against Milo Yiannopoulos, right, the same sorts of things. He was interviewing um, Ezekiel Ox, as he likes to be called, I think his real name's Alan Moran or something, who is again a member of Socialist Alternative, who is as a spokesperson for that. Over and over and over again, people who are openly members of Socialist Alternative come forward as spokespeople for these sort of protests, for these campaigns, and nobody in the media does the simple Google search required to actually mention that they're a member of a group that wants to overthrow the government and abolish private property. Mm. And that was the second part of no, Andrew Bolt's it's, it's interview it's with, with Jacob. Uh, about how much trouble, how much trouble that ditzy chick from Channel 7 got into all right, when she interviewed Blair Cottrell and didn't mention that he mm. was an evil, evil person who shouldn't be interviewed. All right, you think of the massive journalistic response to that, mm. all right, that this is an extremist. You can't not mention someone that is an extremist and try and present them as if they're a normal person. That normalises their ideas. All right, yet they do it over and over and over again with the most extreme political actors in our society. Over uh and over again, it never ends. Which is why I was so glad I had, you know, like uh, <laughs> a little bit of political orgasm over Andrew Bolt actually doing the, actually naming Jerome Small, Emma Black and uh, Jacob. Yeah, and he went it through, he'd actually, had actually done his homework with Jacob. You said this about that we should follow uh, Cuba and Andrew Bolt put the, the question like when has so uh, socialism, when has it actually led to a prosperous society and jacob he paused for a moment and then just went on with a capitalism sucks spiel and i've listened to andrew bolt like interview uh his opponents over the years if somebody's not answering his question directly andrew bolt re-asks it hammers it again you're not answering the question it brings it brings it right back he's like uh, even though he's seen as a commentator he's actually a pretty good interviewer and of course <laughs> That it was in also Jacob. He, he, he there was a lot of uh, qu uh, part of the questions he didn't understand, and he, and he used a lot of, of filler words uh, as well. He, he was sort of a uh, quite nonchalant, <laughs> yeah. So, look, so Jacob is a recent sort of recruit to Socialist Alliance. Uh, or if you've been to a university in Victoria in particular, but even across Australia now, over the course of the last 10 years or so, you would have seen almost zero posters or um like tables or people signing uh, fake petitions and that sort of stuff from Socialist Alliance. But you would have seen hundreds from Socialist Alternative. Socialist Alternative has gotten most of the new young recruits for Marxists in Victoria over the course of this last decade. Uh, that's why they've managed to grow while Socialist Alliance has managed to shrink. The few recruits the Socialist Alliance have got, like Jacob, they're not the brightest bulbs in the drawer. <laughs> Jacob is not a good spokesperson. There's a reason why when Sunrise called, they got Emma Black on, but when Andrew Bolt called, they got Jacob on. <laughs> uh, they didn't want Emma Black getting grilled by Andrew Bolt. Uh, he's got a relatively small audience on Sky, and it really wasn't worth their time. Right, but throwing it off to the subsidiary group who's really only tagging along and you want to throw them Desperate the for publicity. Sure. Why not? Yeah, they are desperate for publicity. And, right, and this is the thing. Every thought, I've read the internal minutes of the meetings that they did whilst they were planning this um, thing. They kept asking journalists to mention who they were over and over again for months. They were begging journalists, even invite friendly journalists to come to their meetings so they could get briefed. And there was almost no news stories about them. All right? They were openly saying, we are planning a recreation of S11. The riots... All right, yeah, their own words. Their own words, repeatedly. They said it again and again. Uh, I think there was three news articles total in the four months leading up. And every single fortnight, every single week, every single meeting, all right, they were actually talking to journalists, trying to say... We're going to do this. Uh, and the people who were talking to the journalists 
were open. Like, they held a... Um, you can find the video of it online. Uh, I believe it's Box 4 or whatever that guy is who filmed some extremist events. Uh, they held a press conference and they invited every journalist they knew to come. Right? And the two speakers were Emma Black, openly a member of Socialist Alternative. She recently wrote an article for Jacobin, the far-left magazine, and her tag offline was, Emma Black is a member of Socialist Alternative. Uh, she's not hiding anything. And the other one was Kath Larkin, who recently stood in the federal election for, so for Victorian socialists and is an open member of Socialist Alternative again. Hmm. Uh, it's like, so there's only two people speaking at the press conference. Uh, actually, there were three, sorry. But two of them were members of Socialist Alternative. And uh, How do you not pick any of this up? How are you that blind? Uh, this is the largest group of political extremists in Australia. They organise about half the damn protests we have. Uh, how can you not figure out this out at this point? You people are professionals. Right? You're being paid a half-decent wage. You've been picked out of the thousands and thousands of people who graduate out of journalism degrees every freaking year. Right? You were chosen. You were picked. You were elevated. Right? You were groomed. Right? And you don't even do a Google search. Right? These people are a disgrace. Uh, it is disgraceful. It is a scandal. It's the largest scandal in Australian journalism, and it is just a shame. And watching them scream and bitch and whine just because a journalist who didn't follow police instructions had two female cops grab him and try and move him out of the way. Oh, no, the girls are beating you up, you big tough man in your nice tailored suit. Hmm. Jesus Christ, these people are sickening. Uh, one of the, it was shared by, I can't remember who the, uh, the leftist on, on Facebook was, but it got a lot of attention when it was sh shared by, uh, Jews against, uh, fascism, which should basically be called, uh, Jews against, uh, Avi Yemeni, he was there on the Tuesday. He got moved on for breaching the peace. It's funny that uh, uh, there was no outrage that uh, citizen journalist uh, Avi Yemeni was uh, ejected uh, from the, uh, the the demonstration, uh, but they they freaked out uh, because yeah, a, uh, a Victoria police officer was photographed uh, doing the OK sign, which people have pointed out it's a Victoria police. Uh, sign communication when they're obviously they can't communicate verbally and so but they obviously they didn't get the the memo that this always means now uh, white supremacy because the anti-defamation league in the united states uh decreed that and so they they didn't like that his apparently his police number wasn't completely in view and then they also got really triggered where there was another they spotted another police officer here he not only covered his name uh, badge and ID, but had a sticker saying "Eat a dick, hippie" over his body cam. <laughs> uh, you see, the firstly onto the name plates and numbers and that sort of stuff. That comes from um, the S11 protest. What the? Because just for those who don't know, S11 protest, Socialist Alternative was there then as well, but they were a small group back then. Uh, the main groups were the International Socialist Organisation, Socialist Alliance. Uh, the Socialist Party with Stephen Jolly, um, a whole bunch of small little Socialist parties and a large sort of anarchist confederation were the main groups that uh, did the main organising stuff for S11 riots that happened in 2000. Uh, and during that, uh, especially the anarchists, but also some of the Marxists started grabbing police nameplates, um, ripping them off their uniforms. Yikes. The police took the nameplates off. Of course, this is against these regulations because they have to be able to be identified, which was later picked up by the ombudsman and used as part of the case for why they should give compensation to the poor uh. protesters that the police might. Right, so it's, it's them trying to pull the same sort of shit that they did with S11, essentially. Um, with the OK sign, I've got to be honest with you, man, I think the copper was actually taking the piss. <laughs> uh, mainly because of who he was doing the OK sign. I saw... Uh, uh, because of who he was doing the OK sign too. Because the Australian Meditations uh, Facebook page is back, uh, that had the, the caption, uh, make him police commissioner. <laughs> uh, the person who took that photo, who has come out and boasted about taking that photo online, is Kim Stern. Uh, Kim Stern started off at Monash a few years ago as a member of Socialist Alternative Group there, along with 
Christy Pasquale, Catherine Robertson, and a whole lot of a whole lot of other people who have gone on to be sort of the middle tier of social and alternative activists. Right, he recently moved up to ANU in Canberra and has sort of taken charge, I guess you'd say, of the socialist alternative unit up there in the ACT. And he travelled down here just to go to this protest. And you can see him in a whole lot of the protest pictures, particularly ones taken by the age for some reason, where he's uh, trying to hold back police, physically impeding police, trying to blockade things himself, and he's definitely there on the front line, just as Natalie Ackerman was, uh, Oliver Downs, who's the socialist alternative guy from La Trobe. There were so many socialist alternative people there. It's, uh, it's amazing. Absolutely incredible. But, um, yeah, so Kim was the one who took the photos. He shared them around the Jews Against Fascism, which has lots of connections to the extreme left, particularly to anarchists. All right, um, they moved, then shared it around. And then the media saw it and shared it around as well, never asking where the photos came from or what their provenance was or why they were sharing a photo taken by a Marxist and shared by an anarchist group. All right. <laughs> the complete lack of any sort of rigorous investigation when it comes to the far left in Australia by Australia's journalists is just insane. Uh, they don't deserve their paychecks. In any want, way, shape, or form. I want and to. Yeah, like I have, even more yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, I can understand your, your your frustration in inventing, but uh, I'll I'll cut you off there because I want to go back to Victoria Police this week because, as I mentioned, the police hierarchy have defended to the hilt uh, their officers' action this week, and it seems to have been Victoria Police is just. They seem to have snapped this week and they've said, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. Because on Thursday nights, I was watching Seven News, the police union is now going to take industrial action from December 1, where they're, they're not going to issue revenue raising fines, which I think is excellent. Which, and actually the police, they're, they're actually communicating there that it's... We just collect these fines because we're ordered to on behalf of government, and we're going to hurt the government by not uh, collecting the, the the revenue for them. Basically, exposing like traffic fines and all that sort of thing as revenue raising exercises. So it's it's it, it, it's a massive uh, indirect uh, revelation there from the the police uh, union, uh, but they're, they're definitely. I'm not sure if you're seeing the same thing, but Victoria Police, they're, they're definitely sick of just dealing with these uh, street activists uh, flouting the, the law. And, of course, the, the police, uh, uh, they do release a lot of them, but some do end up getting to court, like the, the vegans, but they get no conviction and a $100 fine. Yeah, you can't really blame the police for the catch and release when... <laughs> Every time they take these guys to court, they fill out all the paperwork and they actually put them in front of a magistrate. The magistrate lets them go with the slap on the wrist. <laughs> it's absolutely nuts. Now, the issue isn't with the police, it's with the judiciary. Now, it has been for a very long time. Uh, particularly not with the rank and file police, who I think you saw a bit of frustration being released. I think you're right, Tim. Mm. I think it was, uh, we've been putting up this shit for a long time, from these people for a long time. And now these people are trying to disrupt a mining conference that Dan Andrews, the Premier of Victoria, has co-sponsored uh, through the Victorian state government. Um, and Dan Andrews was full, <laughs> was, came out and was very um, fulsome in his praise of Victoria Police's actions. Yeah, uh, and was Lisa Neville as well. Um, yeah, so mm. pretty much the government has backed the police hierarchy who have backed their people for once. <laughs> All right, and it really took, it really, really took a lot of the um, extremists who were protesting by surprise. You saw in a lot of their um, chat groups and a lot of their more public stuff that they did on Facebook, they're like, oh, they were all gentle and we were blocking roads, but now we're blocking a mining conference and they're all, you know, vicious. And it's like, yeah, funny that, eh? Mm. It's like, it's oh, like their, their, their frustration <laughs> and anger builds. <laughs> How long did you guys think you were going to be able to just 
pretty much spit in people's faces, which you were literally doing outside the event. Yeah, uh, uh, they uh, yeah, physically attacked police and uh, police horses, which I said in my introduction, they're supposed to be protesting the Melbourne Cup next week because of animal cruelty. <laughs> they just... Because of animal cruelty. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, and if you saw uh, the footage of where the police horse managed to hurt the um, 23-year-old Chilean activist who was there, uh, they, the police horse went backwards because the other um, leftists were pushing it and then turned, like, uh, and shocking it from the front. So it reared and went backwards onto her. And uh, as anyone who's ever been around horses will tell you, yeah, not a good idea to stand directly behind a horse. Uh, now, as uh, Jacob tried to, to say, oh, it wasn't just the Marxist revolutionaries there. There were members of the, the Greens, uh, which, well, we know what a lot of uh, them believe uh, deep down. But one group that wasn't uh, present this week was Extinction Rebellion, because uh, well, it's mainly Socialist Alternative have been basically at war uh, with Extinction Rebellion uh, for control over the uh, the climate change uh, disruption protests, and you've spoken about previously that uh, the the left they're very good at keeping their their dirty laundry in house. But there's been a Facebook page uh, which has been uh, uh, airing their frustrations uh, with Extinction Rebellion quite publicly. That is the Labor Wave Initiative, which is connected to the uh, the the Facebook uh, blog page. Uh, uh, rantings of a leftist uh, beta cuck and they've said extinction rebellion they love capitalism uh, and the police uh, what uh, what, uh, what piss weak uh, people they are well yeah a big part of it um it's less of a fight between socialist alternative and extinction rebellion than more of a fight within extinction rebellion if you saw the pictures from monday there were a lot of extinction rebellion flags there but they're all being held by people from Extinction Rebellion Students and Youth, Extinction Rebellion RMIT, Extinction Rebellion La Trobe, Extinction Rebellion Melbourne University, right, which are all the Extinction Rebellion groups that Socialist Alternative set up. Yes, so not right, actual they that, Extinction right, Rebellion. Yeah, so they're waving the Extinction Rebellion flag. So it's a battle for the brand name, more than anything else. Right, Socialist Alternative are a minority within Extinction Rebellion in Victoria, but of, as is usual with as anyone who has been a part of any sort of left of centre movement, going back to the 1980s, going back to the anti-nuclear movement, knows Trotskyists, their main tactic is to join a campaign as an organised group and then try and take it over. And that's exactly what Socialist Alternative have tried to do. And when Extinction Rebellion, the original Extinction Rebellion people, started pushing back against Socialist Alternative, that's when you started to see all these rants right, about how they love capitalism and they love the police. Like, that was a big sort of uh, split between the older Extinction Rebellion ones and the, the Socialist Alternative ones was the fact that the older ones were like, well, we want to get arrested because it's our theory that if enough of us get arrested, that'll be a really good form of protest. Uh, so don't be mean to the police. They're helping us. Uh, just cooperate. And Socialist Alternative believes that the police are the, um, what is it, the sort of enforcers of the capitalist system. So they definitely don't believe that you should be nice to the police. They believe you should be as nasty to the police as you possibly can. And that it is ethically entirely okay to assault police, to beat up police, because they are the sort of the coercive instruments of an oppressive capitalist system. Uh, so there have been lots and lots of fights over that, lots of fights over the fact that Socialist Alternative wanted to bring open borders arguments into Extinction Rebellion, which a lot of the greeny ones were just like, why? We're doing climate change stuff. Why are you talking about immigration and refugees? Uh, and as soon as they ask why, anyone who's ever tried to have a discussion with a Marxist will tell you, well, with a, one of these Trotskyists at least, will tell you, right, the asking why was a bad idea, they exploded and started screaming, shouting, jumping up and down and telling everyone about how they're not really activists. You're not really uh, trying to fight the system. You're just tools of the system. You're just like everybody else. Uh, I definitely yeah. yeah. So oh, yeah. the Extinction Rebellion, the Extinction Rebellion didn't show up in large mm. numbers to the IMAR protests, which is which kind of defeated the entire point that they were going for in the first place. Mm. Uh, in some of the internal minutes that were released a couple of weeks ago, inside uh, the IMAR organisers, 
And um, they were actually saying, please, please, everyone, try and reach out to the Extinction Rebellion people, please. We need them to get on board as well. Uh, because they really did want to get, the original plan was to get 5,000 people. All right? And their backup plan was between one and 5,000 people. All right? They got about 400. Uh, and even they, in their planning meetings, because they'd done full surveillance of the building and they knew exactly what was being run and how it was being run. They got inside the um, email groups and internal organising stuff of the IMARC organisers. And so they were really well up on their intelligence and their planning. Um, and they knew that they needed at least three or 4,000 people to actually blockade, I think it's something like 27 major and minor entrances. <laughs> it's a huge building, the Convention Exhibition Centre. Man, <laughs> all those uh, months of planning they wasted. Yeah. Uh, they planned for ages, and the whole idea was to bring people from Extinction Rebellion in, and they failed. Uh, they failed miserably. Uh, the majority of people who were there were socialist alternative people and adjacent. Well, uh, I hope that this week there, has been there, a, party, including Anthony Bain, yeah, a, a tipping point there, uh, in, uh, well, basically exposing who really is behind these so-called grassroots movement i mean well got andrew bolt talking about it that's that's a that's a good start and the fact that their numbers are diminishing i'll i'll wrap this up now uh lucas uh, because you, you no, when no. i have you on you you do get uh, quite fired up and <laughs> but <laughs> especially with your uh rantings against the the, the mainstream media i think you'll get uh total uh, agreement uh, from our audience here about uh, their failures that's why we're we're doing the unshackled <laughs> sorry <laughs> did i mention the media ah yeah. uh, yes that means yes <laughs> <laughs> yeah but uh oh uh, keep it keep an eye out for because yeah they're not going to give oh, up or... there's so much more news coming it's all going to come through to the unshackled website yeah so everybody make sure that they stop in and read up on what our favorite friends on the far left are doing these days yeah take care lucas keep up the great work and we'll chat again soon will do jim thank you for having me on thanks for tuning in to wilms front visit timwilms.com or rational rise tv to view the archive of episodes and keep visiting theunshackled.net to view all our shows and to keep up with the latest real news and analysis.